the Parisian <laughs> connection with the projectile multiple, multiply realizable properties and even Cotomachio, 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 Okay, thank you. Um, so my talk is going to be about multiple realizable properties, and the aim of my talk is, is to show that is to argue that multiple realizable properties are projectable against an argument which has been proposed by Jai Wong Kim. Uh, so very briefly, um, my um, talk has three parts. Uh, what do you mean? Right. So first of all, I'm going to give you a bit of background um, and here, uh, about multiple realizability and introduce Kim's argument. Then I'm going to go through actually one uh, reply which has been already proposed by Ned Block and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why that reply is not <coughs> um, fully satisfactory and then I'm going to provide mine um, to Kim's argument. So, so first of all, so the multiple uh, reusability is the idea that some properties are realized by multiple different <coughs> physical substrates. So first of all, for a property, for a high level property to be realized, that means for the high level property to obtain in virtue of the fact that the low level uh, property, the realizer obtains, right? So uh, the classic example is that pain, which is a high level property, um, it is realized, right? In, in, for example, in humans by C fibers and by A delta fibers, these are fibers of the brains or of, of, the, of the human brain. And whenever these fibers fire, then the subject feels pain, right? So, so that's what what, what it is for a property to be realized by another low-level property, right? And multiplicability uh, says that some high-level property, for example, pain, uh, are realized by different physical substrates. So, for example, in human, pain is realized by C-fiber and a delta fibers. But in other species, for example, octopuses, who, which have, who have, which have uh, different neural substrates from, from ours, uh, they have a different realizers of pain, let's say octopus fibers, and then other species, they have yet different physical uh, realizers of pain, for example, Martians, so species that we have not discovered yet. And uh, so the, the claim of multiple realizability was put forward by Hilary Putnam in the 70s, and the claim it was supposed to be an argument against reductionism. So reductionism is the idea that all properties, all scientific properties, are actually physical properties or are at least explainable by physical, in physical terms, right? So basically all properties are actually physical. Uh, but if some high level properties are multiply realizable, then reductionism cannot be true because in one case we have a high level property which is realized by a, a given physical substrate and that physical substrate is supposed to explain the occurrence of the high level property. But we have different cases in which uh, there are different realizers and so none of the, the realizers that you see down in the schema, which is from the classic paper from Fodor, none of the realizers alone would be sufficient uh, in order to explain the occurrence of the high level property, right? That's what multiple reusability says. And so, um, so the argument is supposed to be reductionism is, is, is false. Um, but Jagon Kim says that this is, this is actually not true because so multiplicable properties cannot, uh, cannot, uh, cannot refute reductionism. And to refute reductionism, actually, it's important to... Um, how do I go back to the... Oh, uh, left should probably... Left arrow. arrow key. Um, ah, okay. Right. So um, if reductionism is false, so since multiplicability is supposed to refute reductionism, it's also supposed to uh, justify the autonomy of special sciences, right? So special sciences are sciences other than physics. So for example, psychology, biology, sociology, economics, and, and, and so on. And uh, the fact that reductionism is not true means that these sciences are actually autonomous from physics, right? Um, but Kim says that that's, that's not the case because actually multiple reusable properties are not scientific. And that's the argument he provides. So the argument goes as follows. So first of all, the first premise is that scientific predicates, scientific properties and kinds are projectable kinds. So we are going to see what that means in a second. Secondly, multiplicable properties, they are not projectable. And that therefore, multiplicable properties and predicates, they are not scientific, right? And just, just to point out the importance of this kind of debates, if that's true that multiplicable properties are not scientific, 
And if that's also the case that special sciences <coughs> properties are multiply realizable, so if the properties studied by special sciences are multiply realizable, then you follow the special sciences are not science after all, because they are not they, they don't study scientific properties, right? So we have to find uh, um, an answer to Kim's to Kim's argument. So let's see what the, the premises um, actually why do they are supposed to hold what do they mean? So first of all, scientific kinds, we can characterize scientific kinds in the debate, they are characterized fairly minimally as the properties uh, that appear in scientific laws. So just to be, to, to be clear, um, here I say properties, but actually I should have said predicates because scientific laws, they are uh, formulated in linguistic terms. And actually, there are predicates in scientific laws. <coughs> but if they are scientific, they denote properties, right? Predicates, scientific predicates, they are supposed to denote properties. And uh, if they are scientific again, they will denote scientific kind. So sometimes I will use, the, I will use these terms interchangeably. Uh, but obviously they are not the same, right? So predicate, they don't always denote properties. And uh, even if they do, maybe these properties are not scientific. But then if, if there is some misunderstanding, we try to make it clear. Otherwise, I will use this term sometimes in the interchangeable. So this is the first, uh, uh, the first scientific kind. And then projectibility. So projectibility is, uh, so I should say that Goodman talked a lot of project, about projectibility, but I'm not, I'm not going to talk about Goodman's sense of projectibility. This is how Kim uh, characterizes projectibility, and this is the sense of projectibility that I'm interested in in this talk. So projectibility is the characteristic of scientific uh, of low-light generalization, sorry, of being confirmed by positive instances of a given type of phenomenon, right? The phenomenon that, that this generalization talk about. And so, for example, um, the gener low-light generalization metals are good conductors of electricity is projectable because it is confirmed if we find an example of a metal, right, which conducts electricity. And uh, that, co that contrasts with, for example, the following generalization. All coins in my pocket are copper, because if you find a, a, a coin which is in my pocket, which is made out of copper, that doesn't tell me anything about the material of other coins which are in my pocket. Um, so, um, so productivity concerns, first of all, generalizations, but we can talk by extension, let's say, of projectable predicates um, whenever these predicates figure in projectable generalizations, right? So pro predicates are projectable insofar as they appear in projectable generalizations. But so the important point to keep in mind here is that the unprojectability, the fact that some generalizations are not projectable, might be due to the nature of the predicates which appear in this generalization. But if if, uh, so the relation of between the, the projectivity of predicates and, and that of generalizations is kind of tricky, but this is what's important for me. That some generalization might be non-projectable because of the nature of the predicates. So this is the argument in support of the second premise, namely that multiversible properties, they are not projectable, and that's uh, from, from Kim. So the argument goes as follows. So first of all, multiply realizable properties and predicates actually are nomologically coextensive and therefore equivalent to the disjunction of the realizers uh, of the multiply realizable properties. So this is what Kim says. Now, to be coextensive, so, ex so first of all, the extension of a predicate is the set of things to which the predicate applies to, right? So the, the extension of the predicate red is the set of red things. And to be coextensive means to have the same extension. Uh, now, what Kim says about multiply realizable properties, this is the scheme I, I just showed you, is that they are not coextensive at the high level properties, multiply realizable properties, they are not coextensive with any of the realizers alone, right? But they are actually coextensive with the whole disjunction of the realizers, because whenever the high level property occurs, it must be the case that at least one of the disjuncts, which is the realizer, occurs too, right? Even though not all of them occur, but one of them occurs too, but that's a disjunction. And so the disjunction and the high level property, they apply to the same set of things, right? Of this here, uh, to some extent. Uh, and, uh, if, and they are coextensive, the true predicates, the disjunction, low disjunction, the high disjunction, they are coextensive as a matter of um, nomological necessity, let's say. So that, that depends on how the laws of nature of our universe are made. And um, because we, here we are talking about, about uh, generalizations, which are supposed to be laws. Uh, and uh, and um, 
And the realization relation, Kim says, should hold uh, as a matter of nomological necessity. So given this strong correlation between the two properties, we can consider that the two properties, the high-level properties multiply realizable, and the low-level uh, disjunction of the realizers, they are actually equivalent, um, as far as the extension goes. And this is the first premise. So the second premise uh, is that actually disjunctive predicates, heterogeneously disjunctive predicates, they are unfit for projections. They, they are not projectable because they would sanction an illegitimate, not legitimate confirmation procedure. And that is because the reason for that is because these junctions, they are satisfied even though only one of the disjuncts is satisfied. So if we try to project, if we try to confirm a disjunction, the disjunction is confirmed even though only one of the disjuncts is confirmed, right? <coughs> And, but there, that's illegitimate. We cannot confirm something without confirming all the things that it mentions, right? Intuitively, and therefore, multiply, uh, and therefore, disjunctive predicates are uh, not projectable because the additions would be confirmed without being tested. And given the equivalence between multiplicable properties and the disjunction of the realizers, it follows that actually multiplicable properties are not projectable, right? And so here is an example. From, from Kim's paper. So Kim says, consider this generalization, namely, sharp pains administered at random intervals cause anxiety reactions, right? This is a putative law of psychology. And he says, suppose that this generalization has been confirmed for humans, should we expect on that basis that the same generalization will hold for species that we have not yet discovered or test the, the, law, the law upon? For example, Martians, right? And he says, no, we shouldn't expect that if we accept the physical realization thesis, right? Which is the thesis that uh, high-level property are realized by physical entities. So this argument goes in support of, um, of the second premise. And therefore, he concludes that multiple as well properties are not scientific. So I'm going to skip on, uh, on Fodor's reply, but if anyone is interested, we can talk about that in the q &A. So Bloch, here is how, how Bloch uh, thinks about this. This, this, this problem, how Bloch tries to solve the, the problem. So Bloch distinguishes between two types of properties, what he calls <coughs> D-proper... Oh, that's, that's kind of... Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, he distinguishes between, between D-properties uh, and R-properties. Uh, so D-properties, D from design, are properties which are... Oh, okay, no, so that's bad, because design is selected. <laughs> <laughs> But so D properties are properties which are selected um, by what he calls forces of convergence, which are forces such as uh, evolutionary force or conscious design or learning. Uh, so this force converge um, on, on some high level, let's say, properties which are selected because they have a certain function. They do something which is important for these forces. Uh, and that contrasts with R properties, which are uh, properties or actually phenomena, so here what Brock has in mind is actually generalization, not properties. But properties are so to the extent that the generalizations are so, let's say. But we are going to see an example in a second. So D properties, they contrast with R properties, which are properties um, which depend on how a high level property is realized in a certain uh, realization context, in a certain realizer, right? So that these are properties which are due to the peculiarity of the realization base and not to the function that the high-level property has or does. So here are two examples. So as an example of a D property, we can take actually Kim's putative law, which is sharp pains administer the random, random intervals cause anxiety reaction. And that can be considered as a D property. It's a D generalization involving D property, D properties. Uh, because that's plausibly, let's say, uh, that's plausibly evolutionary useful to have this kind, to, to show this kind of pattern. So that whenever we have pain, we are anxious because we want to avoid, avoid the pain, right? And so the, the two properties which are mentioned in the generalization, they are D properties because they appear in a generalization which is, let's say we can consider, we can assume, which is shaped by uh, a force of, of convergence, which is an evolutionary force. In, the, in this case, and that contrasts with the second example uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm providing, uh, which is a phenomenon which is called aridontalgia. So that's basically uh, that's uh, stimulating the nasal mucosa that recreates previous dental pain, uh, previous dental pain. So basically, 
you touch the nasal mucosa and the, the subject has some previous dental pain he had in, at some point of his life. And this, this thing, this, this phenomenon, this is really due to, the, to how dental pains are realized in humans. Because the realization is connected to, to somehow to nasal mucosa, right? So I hope the distinction is kind of clear. And now what Bloch says, Bloch uses this distinction to say that actually the questions uh, of whether a property is projectable and whether it is a scientific kind, these are relative questions. These are relative because these are relative to the property with respect to the first property is being projected, right? So we cannot say that the property is a scientific kind or not. We, we should ask the question in relation with the property with respect to which this property is being projected, because actually what we project are generalizations, not properties. And therefore, the question of whether a property is a scientific kind or not uh, is graded, because uh, we have indifferent, uh, so depending on the type of property which is at stake, we have different degrees of kindness or scientificity. Uh, so for example, um, Going back, we have that um, pain is more of a scientific kind in, in the first case uh, because the, the generalization is more projectable than the second, and the second is less scientific kind because that's due to the realization base. And so, key, uh, so Bloch says that actually Kim's apparatus, conceptual apparatus, is just wrong, and that these question, this questions cannot uh, be answered in absolute terms, right? They, they have to be relativized to the property with respect to which the property we are considering is being projected. And that's uh, the sentence is graded. Uh, it's graded because also in the case of the R property, there is some reason to think that other, so in the first case, in the degeneralization case, Bloch says that we have a lot of reasons to think that actually other species will obey the law, right? Because the law, the generalization is highly projectable because it's a degeneralization, because it is selected, right? And in the second case, we have very low uh, reasons to, to think so. But actually, he says that we do have still some reason to think so because there are some constraints um, which are put, um, which are th that realizers have, right? So a thinker cannot be, be made of just whatever because there are some constraints that the thinker must, that the realizer of the thinker, a realization of the thinker must, must obey. Uh, because, so for example, a thinker cannot be made of, out of water because that's not solid enough. And so, and therefore, there are some reason to think also that to some extent, <coughs> lower extent than the first uh, generalization, other species will, ob will obey the second law. And that's what he calls Disney principle, but well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will not tell you why, but <laughs> maybe you are interested. Uh, so that's what he says, the forces that create complex functions can only move into certain channels, the ones provided by the descriptions mentioned in Disney principles, uh, that these are the constraints. And, that, and then he says, when I can expect different strengths of projectability with respect to different sorts of properties, given the Disney principle, there is a non-zero probability of similarity even in the realization of properties. And he, he goes on uh, to say, is the disjunction a kind? So this is the answer to Kim's dilemma. Is the disjunction a kind? Kim says no, because they are disjunctive and they are not projectable. A, a Block says, the answer is, is that it's yes and no in various degrees. The disjunction is a kind relative to psychological design properties, but to a lesser extent, uh, relative to physical chemical properties themselves. However, there are some problems with um, how satisfactory is Bloch's reply. And is, the problem is that Kim's point actually remains. And what I want to point out is that there seems to be an inductively relevant difference uh, between two cases. The first case is when we project a generalization, whatever, whichever type of generalization, on the same type of entities with respect to which it had already been tested before. So we test, we have a generalization, you take just whichever generalization, a degeneralization, R generalization, you test it on humans, and then we have a, some high degree of expectancy that new instances of humans, right, not tested yet, but of the same type of entities, will obey the, the law. So this is the first case, so the same type of entities, when the generalization is projected on the same type of entities. And on the other hand, uh, when we uh, consider whether a generalization that we test on humans is projectable to other species. And that is true, it seems to me, uh, so let's say regardless of, uh, regardless from whether the generalization is a degeneralization or a R generalization. 
Uh, so what I said is that the difference between a degree of certainty that other humans, by contrast to octopuses of March, will, will obey both the Ardontalgia law and the anxiety law. So in both cases, we have, a, we have a, 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 more, a lot of more reasons to think that humans will obey the law than other species. Even though in, in one case, we have a little bit of reasons more to think that the <coughs> deep property uh, will hold for other species. <coughs> And so blocks, what I say is the blocks reply is not able to differentiate between two cases, but this is really it's what is needed to meet King's challenge. And so why is this so? So why is, is blocks reply so unsatisfactory, seems so unsatisfactory? And the, the reason is that actually King's points concern the structure of disjunctive predicates, right? Which is an a priori fact. Prima facie, well, first class. It seems to be an a priori fact, right? The structure of disjunctive predicates. Whereas Bloch's reply is about empirical a posteriori facts, right? So the fact that our universe happens to be such that there are some forces which, are, which have made some laws more uh, believable for other species than others. So there are, these are two different, uh, two different uh, ways of approaching the question. But that doesn't, meet um, that doesn't, doesn't really answer to Kim's point. It really changes the framework, right? Obviously, Bloch is aware of that. But it doesn't m seem to, to, to be fully satisfactory. And uh, so uh, what Bloch says is what is required for a high degree of projectability is that processes like selection and design have connected properties that would not otherwise be connected. But what Kim says in his paper is that this junction is implicated in this failure of projectability can be seen in the following way, namely ta -da -da, what I've just said. And so there seems to be two ways, uh, what I call two dimensions, two ways the projectivity of a property can vary, right? Two um, dimensions, let's say, but this is really terminological, that's nothing substantial about dimensions, right? So that's really to say that there are two ways a, a project, um, the projectivity of a property can vary, and the first way is relative to the other property with respect to which it is being projected, namely whether the generalization is a degeneralization that we have high reasons to believe that other species will obey or not, or our generalization. So this is the first way project media property can vary, and the second is this kind of vertical dimension, which is whether we are projecting the property to the same type of entities with respect to which we have already tested the properties, or we are projecting the, the, the property to different uh, types of entities, heterogeneously different. And so this is what so this is my what what I am going to uh, to to say about this problem. And on on the same track of my previous remark, I want to distinguish two types, yet two types of projectability in Kim's sense, so again, absolute here it just contrasts with the relative, that just mean what means what Kim uh, means, right, by projectivity. So we have to distinguish two types of projectivity, restricted, when we project the generalization on the same type of entities, that was what I just said, and unrestricted project projectivity, when we project the generalization on different types of entities, right? So here's the point, Kim's argument, so Kim assumes that uh, low, multiply realizable laws, right? Laws that involve multiply realizable properties, they should be projectable in the unrestricted sense, right? Because Kim says, should we believe that the generalization will hold for Martians, for example? That's the unrestricted sense. But is the assumption warranted? I'm gonna argue that it is not. So here is some science, I hope. <laughs> so this example I, uh, I've taken. So uh, this is the Wiener France law, and the Wiener France law says that very, very, to put it very simply, that um, metals, whenever they conduct electricity, they also heat up, right? And that's because uh, in most metals, um, uh, the uh, particles which conduct electricity, they also uh, um, bring um, heat. They also, they also bring vibrate. heat, right? Sorry? Yeah, they vibrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the same particle do the same job, let's say. Um, However, so this is what William France law says. However, um, we have the recent finding from Lee and others that vanadium dioxide, which is a metal, violates the William France law, right? Because it conducts electricity without heating up. And that's because in the, that metal, the, the two, two jobs are made by different uh, particles. And uh, so vanadium dioxide conducts electricity without heating up. And so the question I want to ask is does the William France law need? 
to be projectable to all types of metals, so every type of metal whatsoever in order to be scientific, and the intuitive answer is that no, it does not, right? So to some extent we would have expected that vanadium dioxide would have obeyed the law, but before testing vanadium dioxide, if one tells you, hey, do you think that the law is, uh, is not scientific if that doesn't give us reason to think that uh, vanadium dioxide will not obey the law. I, I think that does, we don't have to require that. And so uh, I, I say that Kim's assumption is not warranted because no scientific property or law is projectable in the unrestricted sense, right? Mm -hmm. So why should we require that multiple razoal properties have to be projectable in that sense? And so what I want to say is that the semantic import, actually the extension, let's say, of multiple razoal scientific predicates has to be restricted to some extent, at least as far as projectability uh, is concerned. Right? So uh, what I want to say is that in the William France law, before testing it on balanced dioxide, what metals has to refer to are just only the types, the same the type, that types of metals on which the law has already been uh, tested. So here is a, an objection <laughs> that I am going to skip because I don't have enough time. Um, and here is a more substantive objection, which is, um, which is that actually you're, you're, you know, you, namely me, <laughs> I'm using a, a, a physical law, but actually multiply realizable uh, properties and laws, they are different from physical laws because they are multiply realizable, right? Because the properties are multiply realizable. And that is the reason actually why multiply realizable properties should be unrestrictedly projectable, a scheme requires, right? And so that would uh, go against me, obviously. Um, but what I want to, to, to answer to, to this reply is that, so first of all, one might think, one might try to argue that actually me even metals, they are multiply, so the, the high level property of metal is multiply realizable, right? Because we have different physical realizers of metal. We have vanadium dioxide, uh, copper, and so on. Um, but independently from this issue, which can be can be can be can be contested, independently from this issue, actually, I want to propose that multiply uh, realizable scientific kinds they uh, can be individuated without requiring them to pick out all of the realizers. So we have a way of conceiving those properties without requiring them to be uh, about all the possible realizers, uh, all the possible realizers. And this is how I propose to do so. This is what I call top-down uh, individuation, and uh, approximately, right? So the idea is that actually we, we, we define a high-level multiple properties in high-level terms without referring to the, to, the, to the details of any realizer, right? So we define a high-level property. Uh, so pain is the functional property, da da da, or whatever high-level property. Uh, then uh, we fix a realizer type. Once we have the high level property, we fix the realizer, a, a given type of realizers oh, on which we are going to test the property, the high level property, right? So, um, <coughs> so we, we, we fix the realizer. So for example, we have pain and we say that realizer, the, the realizer of pain uh, at first is human brain, human's brain, and, and, and thereby the high level property becomes absolutely projectable in Kim's sense, absolutely projectable on new instances of humans once we have fixed the, the realization base, right? And if that, that is confirmed, then that will give us reason mm -hmm. to think that new humans will obey the same law, the, the law uh, which in, within which the high level property is embedded, right? And, uh, and that, that, that alone, that uh, already ensures us that the property is, is projectable in Kim's sense. And then we can add new realizer types by using <coughs> pragmatic heuristics, right? So we see that that holds on humans, but maybe we think that that could hold for other animals because of some heuristics. And then we add new, and new realizer types to the initial realization basis, right? And so we gradually add the realization basis without requiring the high level property to pick out all possible realizers. And so that's how I propose to individuate multiple realizable properties. And what I want to, what, what I really think is that Brock's sense of relative projection should really be conceived as a pragmatic heuristic used to extend multiple realizable scientific kinds to um, heterogeneous, to new types, different types of entities. So this is all I have to say. This is the conclusion.
Um, so what I conclude is that multiplicable properties, they are as projectable as any other scientific property, which is to say they are projectable in the absolute restricted sense, restricted on the same type of entities. They are relatively, in block sense, projectable to whatever type of entities because everything is, because that's just pragmatics, pragmatic reasoning. But they are not absolutely projectable, absolutely in Kim's sense, projectable in the unrestricted sense, which is what Kim assumes in his argument. And therefore, multiplicative mm -hmm. properties, they can be considered scientific uh, as far as the projectability, that, uh, the projectability test is um, concerned. Thank you for this uh, really interesting. I, I, I more got rapidly, a little, more rapidly. little confused. The Vanadium dioxide <laughs> is not a metal, it's, it's an oxide of a metal. So I, I sorry, sorry, I have not heard. Vanadium, vanadium oxide is not a metal, it's an oxide of a metal. So I, I, I'm not sure whether that's important, but if, if it's all about metals, mm -hmm. yeah. it, it yeah. should be applicable to vanadium and not vanadium oxide. And I want to resist the claim that metals are multiply realizable, because I think the typical behavior that you will see of metals this is uniquely realized by, by one and the same mechanism. So sure, you have different metals, yeah. but, but those differences are not relevant to the way we actually exhibit the metallic behavior. In the same way that, that for example, hydrochloric acid and nitric acid are, are clearly different chemical substances, but the way they, they exhibit their acidic behavior is by donating protons. So they, they both use the same behavior. So this is, in a sense, uniquely realized. Yeah, this is the type of question I was hoping for. Um, I'm not a physician, um, but this is precisely the reason why I'm saying that my reply does not hinge on considering metal multiple reusable, right? And that's why I propose this way of enabling <coughs> multiple reusable properties, which holds regardless from whether metals are multiple real, physical properties are multiple reusable or not. And and so. As concerned the first question, but the oxide is not a metal. I, I don't know, you, you should argue with Lee and others, <laughs> maybe. Because what they say is that we report an order of magnitude breakdown, breakdown of the Weidmann Franz law. And so if vanadium dioxide is not a metal, that's hard to, to, to understand why that would be a violation of the Weidmann Franz law, right? Yeah. Because the Weidmann Franz law concerns metal. So maybe you, you can go and argue with that. So, but so I should have said that actually this is right, really an example. So the vanadium dioxide law is really an example because actually Kim uses the example of metals, right? This is Kim's example to say that some generalizations are projectable and this is what Kim says about metals. And I just Googled it and I found this vanadium dioxide and I thought, okay, that's a super nice example. But you can find a lot of examples. You can take a, a law which is thought to be a scientific law now and, and then you can think, so is this, this law going to hold for other, uh, for now, untested types of entities? And the answer I want to give is that we should not require them if we stick to Kim's sense of projectability, right? Then if we go to, to, to block sense, the obvious, whatever is projectable. Is that, that's that then. I actually almost had the same question as, as you. It's, despite what Lee said, they're just wrong. It's not a metal. So like, All right. I think that's the end of the story. But, uh, but, but. I think you could find other examples. Yeah, I think. Right. Yeah. I think you could find other examples. That said, I wonder whether or not this is the best type of law to illustrate your point, which I think is correct. Okay. Right. right? Uh, I think your point is correct. The reason why is that this is like an empirical law that is known that it's not. A, it's the only sense in which it's correct is if you don't measure things too too precisely. Uh, and in fact, most metals violate it to some degree yeah. or other if you can measure them precisely yeah. enough. Uh, so the thing is that uh, vanadium dioxide is, is particular because it violates the law in, so let's say, high temperature, which are not as high as one would think because they are 2014 to 3014 Kelvin, which is really, really normal temperature. And that's why vanadium dioxide really violates that law. And it's not, you know, so Lee and others, they say, we, we have already observed the same violation of the same law, but that was just a cryogenic, cryogenic temperatures, right? Like absolute zero. 
and that's really that's really normal temperature it's violates the law then if that's that's not a metal I really should change an example but <laughs> I was not so I was expecting physical questions but not the vanadium dioxide is not a metal because then <laughs> Lee and others they are just yeah I, I think if you do a, a search you'll find other yeah, yeah, examples yeah. that will be helpful some of them, uh, so some people have already suggested me some examples. And that one, um, Yanis suggested me concerned um, the right handedness or left handedness of some atoms. But then I don't know anything, really anything about that. I should, leave, uh, should delve into more details. But yeah, th thanks anyway for this. This is obviously important because I cannot make the case if that's not right. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering whether your reply could not. Um, still be regarded as somewhat reductionist in spirit uh, because um, when you have these laws like the wiedemann franz law um, as, as uh, the example you gave uh, that are not in the unrestricted sense projectable um, you would normally have i guess um, replacement law maybe that um, is explicitly restricted to um, those kinds of realizers uh, for which it works which is still um, projectable in the unrestricted sense maybe and if we have such a replacement law that at first looks uh, like a better um, law and a better candidate for like being ontologically committed to the kind of entity that appears there. Yeah. So I guess that uh, reductivists um, could just say, well, uh, this uh, speaks in favor of our position because the uh, real laws, the uh, laws that are projectable in the unrestricted sense, they only contain um, the non-multiply realizable properties. So what do you mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. Because after you have like uh, yeah. made all the distinctions, yeah. then you end up with probably non uh, multiply realizable yeah. laws um, or properties that uh, are projectable in the unrestricted sense. So right. thanks for the question. But so notice that I'm not trying to defend anti-reductionism this mm -hmm. So that's <laughs> not my. Ah, okay. uh, so even if multiply realizable properties they happen to 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 be reduced after all, mm -hmm. still they are scientific, right? That, that's what I'm defending here. But. Uh, I, uh, obviously I see the point, uh, but what I say to that is that just that they are not unrestricted projectable, but if we find a high level property which is, um, so if we um, um, define high level property and fix a realizer, right, mm -hmm. and we see the high level property um, holds for the realizer, and then, so we, we think the property holds for that, but then we had another realizer type, mm -hmm. then the, the law is really multiple realizable, it's hard to see how that can be reduced, right? Mm -hmm. Because these are two different uh, orders of, uh, of, of, of science. Uh, yeah, well, so you, you say if yeah, yeah. metal is multiple realizable, yeah. then that does not guarantee the, the, the anti-reductionism, right? Yeah. But then what I, can, what I can say is that that does not imply reductionism either. And that's maybe an empirical question, whether we can reduce them, and that depends on whether we can find uh, scientific generalizations which hold only, so which hold uh, for the high level properties and that we cannot, you know, study by studying the realizers. Yeah, I see. But I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm yeah. not. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah. But if you want to go, to go back to. Uh, uh, no, no, maybe back. Okay. Yeah. Discuss it later. Last yeah. question. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I was just wondering about the pragmatic heuristic you were talking about when widening the number. If you just go back to this. this Ah, yeah. So when you widen the number of um, realizers, I was wondering, would, wouldn't this like introduce some human element into some human or human? Human, human, not <laughs> human, <laughs> not human. <laughs> oh. human element. Into Something human. Yeah, yeah, because that's pragmatic. So. Yeah, of course. But but then but then the worry is, wouldn't introducing this pragmatic element somehow um, reintroduce or introduce the idea that? Uh, it's somehow not uh, like I don't know how to put it. Like the idea that the idea that uh, like like real. <laughs> like I, was thinking, like I was searching for that. Like no, the idea that the science, the, the scientific theory, it's not. So if it's if we, if we introduce pragmatic realizers, then the sci the science that uses them is not as. Yeah. But, super, so, <laughs> but su super nice because that's what I, I, I say to Block, right? That's actually your thing is just pragmatic and we need something more um, semantic to meet Kim's challenge. And, and this is why I'm using his way of conceiving projectability as a pragmatic heuristic. Okay, so, you, so you're just uh, taking one step back and saying, like taking a stock and say, like owning the pragmatic thing and saying, okay, I'm... I'm Assuming a pragmatic stance, so you cannot fault me anymore. No, no, no. no. Mm. 
No, no, no. I, 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 I provide my semantic stance, right? That we okay. should restrict productivity in okay. Kim's sense. And that what's, that's what's needed to meet Kim's challenge. And then if we want to make something out of Bloch's proposal, is that we should conceive it as a pragmatic heuristic, right? Because that depends on a posteriori facts. That depends on the fact that we have more reasons to believe that the anxiety law will hold for Martians more than the realizer law. And that, that's, that's why I, I, I think it's important to provide the semantic story, right? That, but that's, that's obviously, that, that's, that's right what to say, but that, that goes in my direction. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I sympathize with this, just that many, some people might uh, have some... I mean, block surely won't agree. Block, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for this. So let's thank our...